It really is a great model that's been made with pride. Big hello to you, welcome back to the channel. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you up here to the loft on Weir Yard. Now today we're going to be taking a look at the all new 78XX Manor from Daypol. And this is a model that's been much requested on the channel that I take a look at. So I'd like to extend a huge, huge thanks to Daypol for allowing me to do this by sending over one of the models. We're also going to be doing a full DCC fitting guide using the Trainomatic Next 18 decoder. And if you've come here just to see how to do that, then stay tuned for the final third of the video. We've got the information there. But come with me today in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support for today's video comes from All Mouse Media, publisher of books and graphics novels, which can be found at the link down below. Check them out today, including the amazing Stars books. I'm really excited by this model. It's certainly one that we've been looking forward to for quite some time. And don't forget that we've got some affiliate links in the description box down below to help you find your own version of this model if it's something that you really like the look of today. I'd like to thank Daypol for very kindly sending over one of their all new 78XX Manor class locomotives for review. And as you can see, it comes in the standard Daypol box, which is really quite hard wearing. And I know some people just do the James May thing and whiz these things in the bin. But if you do want to store your locomotives in them, they do protect them really well and are very long lasting. Now, the locomotive that they've sent over is catalog number 4S-001-002. And this is Fringford Manor number 7814 in the Great Western Green with GWR on the tender. And you can see there, it's designed for a maximum recommended radius of radius two, which is 17 and a quarter inches. So ironically, it's the large radius from Hornby 00. Now the manners themselves were designed to be a slightly lighter version of the Grange. And like the Grange, the first 20 at least of this class were built using reconditioned parts from the 43XX moguls. And they were built in 1938, 1939, so just immediately before the Second World War. Later on, actually, in 1950, BR built another batch, this time of 10. Uh, of course, those locomotives were entirely new and didn't feature any reconditioned parts from previous locomotives. The model does come with uh, quite a nice little booklet, and this does give a little bit of a uh, short history of the class. Now, uh, Daypol are producing examples from both different build batches. Uh, this is from the earlier of the build batches. Now, despite there being 30 of these locomotives built, they've actually survived incredibly well in preservation with a grand total of nine actually surviving to still exist today, which is quite a healthy number from that uh, original number built. They were very, very successful, and certainly uh, that is reflected by the number that did last into preservation. The model itself comes with Daypol's very revolutionary tender drawbar pickup, which as you can see here, very, very easy to have the locomotive and the tender separated from each other. But if you place them on uh, something like level track or even on your workbench such as this, it's quite easy to just line them up and very gently but firmly clip them together. And these are now pretty well secured. And that means that we've got all of those power links across that drawbar without having little tiny wires which can be very susceptible to being damaged. 
In with the model we've also got some etched number plates which do match the model and these are there if you do wish to add an etched nameplate you don't need to buy these separately. The model does come with very fine printed number plates and actually for my eyes these actually do look pretty good. Now I'm just going to very carefully separate the tender and the locomotive because it does make showing you all of these bits and pieces really really easy. So if we get nice and close to that you can see that the printed detail on that is actually really really nice and I personally won't be going to the effort of gluing on the number plates although if you do I recommend that you use something like a very very tiny amount of PVA and use the printed number plate as your template your guide to make sure everything matches up. Under BR these were classified as 5 mixed traffic 5MT and under the GWR this was a D class locomotive uh, which really just signified uh, the amount of power that it had available and the sort of work it could be pressed into doing. The model itself, first impressions, are really good. There's a reasonable weight to this and I can feel in my hands that certainly there's a lot of weight where it needs it over the driving wheels. This um, safety valve bonnet as well, I really do like that uh, kind of highly polished almost mirror finish that's going on there and this is much nicer than some of the painted finishes that we've seen on locomotives from a variety of manufacturers and certainly the Great Western Railway had this very distinctive feature and certainly even locomotives that they inherited or bought in from other railway companies tended to become Swindonized which essentially meant they got the brass safety valve bonnet. The front chimney cap is this slightly more dull copper colour and again I do like that we've got the representation of the metallic finish really well done in fact feeling that that does seem to be a turned metal part. Looking around the rest of the locomotive it's got the characteristic fat cylinders, the Great Western Railway with its legacy of Brunel and the broad gauge uh, did have a much wider envelope to play with and that meant that the locomotives could pack quite a punch with these bigger slightly wider cylinders and it did mean that when these locomotives ventured beyond the western region uh, they did have a, a little bit of a habit of uh, taking off uh, platform coping stones in a number of places so they were restricted off the Great Western Railway system. Looking to the back we've got a nice clear view there into the cab. We've got all of the back head detail printed on. It's uh, really nicely done. There's a lot going on in there. Not really much in the way of separately fitted parts um, but certainly what there is really does look effective. The rest of the cab does look a little bit spartan but certainly I don't think the Great Western Railway liked their crews to uh, sit down. Um, there's nothing in the cab itself for sitting on. The reverser mechanism there on the right hand side really is quite nicely done and the glazing is flush not just on the outside but as you can see there on the inside there's no great big chunk of clear plastic blocking our view which is really really nice. We've also got these very very fine metal handrails at the back and they are quite robust. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any sign of or risk of them coming free. There's just a little bit of a bend there on the one on this side but actually all well within tolerance. When we've got the tender and locomotive apart like this you can see that innovative connector there and it does have a degree of movement and this self-centering mechanism which does allow this locomotive to negotiate down to those radius 2 curves. The full plate is fixed in position and we do get that checker plate finish but actually it's fixed in the down position and um, that seems to work pretty well. The back of the locomotive is fairly spartan you can see there but of course you're not really going to see that when locomotive and tender are connected. 
We've also got a firebox flicker down in there, and this is a feature that Daypole have really spearheaded in their locomotives, even in those as small as the Terrier. And if you DCC fit these locos yourself, you do need a decoder that has at least two DCC functions to be able to do the DCC flicker. We've got a yellow LED and an orange LED, but if you are DCC fitting it yourself, you may need to change some CVs just to get the flickering effect going on. The inside motion is visible. You can just see that there in the red underneath the boiler. There is quite a pleasing gap underneath the boiler and it really does show off the representation of that uh, central uh, motion. The nameplates on the splashers are an etched metal piece and they are again firmly fitted on and really do look nice and look the part. We've got some very very fine linkages there for the reverser going down to the mechanism and looking underneath we've got a metal running plate which is Pretty nice and robust and we've got all of the detail going on there. Factory fitted brake linkages too, which is quite nice. I mean, they're not that difficult to fit, but it is a nice touch to have everything where it needs to be from the factory. We've also got the drain cocks there on the base of the cylinders. And this front pony truck is sprung at the center, just like the prototype. And it's quite slender. When you look at that, it does look very much like the prototype. And it has this kind of V shape to get it to um, just extend out as it goes around corners to help it go around those really tight corners. And that just brings it back when it's on the straight. The front coupling does come factory fitted and it just slips into that NEM pocket so you can remove this and in the detail bag we do have some vacuum pipes but it does mention in the instructions that these are something that if you do fit them they will obstruct this coupling so really it's a case of making that decision do you want the coupling in place. On this model we do have pipe work all fitted there on the uh, front buffer beam. The rivet detail is really quite crisp and clear. Again, so is the number 7814 with the drop shadowing. The front buffers are sprung, turned metal and really do have a great look to them. The spring is actually quite firm. It's there, it's not too lacklustre. And we also have the centre coupling hook factory fitted as standard. We have the lamp irons, these are separate metal parts. And the front face of the locomotive really is captured well with that dished smoke box door and uh, a number of other details, including the metal handrails. I do like this glossy black finish to not just the underside of the chassis, but the smoke box as well. And Daypol have really captured this kind of satin finish really, really well. It looks like a clean, well turned out locomotive and it doesn't look toy like at all. The wheels too, the correct pattern, we've got metal coupling rods, the correctly fluted rods up to the crosshead slide here. Everything is made of metal and I do like that very heavy machined metal parts that are going on here. They really do look the business, it's hard wearing and certainly has all the feel of a quality model that's been made with pride. Looking towards the back, the cab steps, these feel like again these are metal very very robust and again we can see there the rivet detail on the side of the cabs the cab windows picked out with that brass beading and the firebox has the requisite shape it's actually quite a complex shape there and really does seem to capture the very characteristic great western railway taper that you get with the kind of hump there between the boiler where it connects into the firebox. Whistles are plastic but they are very well done and they've got that shroud around them and it, it really does ooze detail and charm. I'm going to move over to the tender and again this is uh, actually got some really good weight to it. There is space within this to solder in an additional base speaker if you go down the sound fitted route. The factory fitted sound versions do already, according to the instructions, have that speaker in place. 
but if you do fit your own sound installation then that is there as an option for you and again it's just simply a case of soldering in the correct ohmage speaker and uh, all the other connections are taken care for you with this very innovative drawbar setup. The front of the tender we've got all of the, the brake wheels and the cradle if you want to fit this with the appropriate tools as well. We've got big dome at the back of the tender again another characteristic feature of great western locomotives the tender divider there it's firmly attached it feels like this whole top is all one molding so there's no parts to come loose we've got lamp iron separately fitted metal and actually despite the instructions talking about separately fitted vacuum pipes this model does appear to have everything it needs ready fitted so actually again there's not really anything to worry about there's just one pipe maybe two inside the detail pack that comes with it and I will talk a little bit about some of the other items that are in there because they will come into their own in a moment the rear buffers again sprung correctly metal turned and tapered and the uh, shanks here we've got again that really characteristic great western railway look to them all of the brake rigging comes factory fitted there's nothing here for the end user to need to fit there is additional pickups it seems from the tender wheels to just add to the reliability of the locomotives running and the rear coupling again slimline tension lock factory fitted and it does have a self-centering mechanism to assist it if you do wish to run these on tighter curves with coaches to ensure that you get the maximum reliability of running and just to help with any close coupling. The wheel patterns again we've got very well represented wheels with those single spokes they're quite big wheels but certainly they look the part and uh, I do like the blackened finish that these come with. Tender sides have the correct pattern of rivets and the GWR has this really really nice drop shadowing that is very crisp and clear with what appears to be a number of different colour passes we've got a kind of yellowy gold colour, the red and black there as well and none of these are running into each other none of them look like they've been printed out of alignment which is really nice on the back of the tender that rivet detail does look neat and tidy well represented we've got these foot holes here the separately fitted these feel like plastic but again quite robust handrails and I do like that printed works plate on the back of the tender and again under close magnification that does look really really good and you can decipher all of the detail the coal load on these is removable so I'm just going to tip that out and underneath we've got the full accurate representation of the tender interior you can see how the water tank actually dominates the tender itself and the coal just in the main sits on top so you can use this to model with real coal any level of coal that you wish in this model although the plastic coal insert is really really well done and again they're getting so so good at representing coal in this uh, plastic insert and quite frankly yeah I just tend to leave these as they are just going to fiddle that back in fits quite neatly in place and uh, certainly there's nothing here to really count against the model looking to the extras bag now let's just see what we've got the tool for getting into the front we're going to deal with that in a moment a speaker enclosure again I'll show you where that goes in a moment now we do have I think this is the sanding mechanism there is a little tiny bit in the instruction booklet that tells you a little bit about these so we've got the sanding lever it shows it here hidden away underneath and that does appear to be this little part here it's really nice that Daypol have included it but again I don't really feel that if you are a little bit uh, timid about fitting these detail parts really I wouldn't worry too much about it 
quite frankly, if they hadn't said it was not uh, fitted uh, in place out of the box, then I wouldn't really have been all that bothered. We've also got that vacuum hose, although I'm not entirely clear where this goes. But when we look at the buffer beams on the back, and again, on the front, there's no obvious place for it, and really it doesn't look out of place without it. Again, it's a part that if you want to fit it, you can, but I wouldn't be too bothered about uh, running this model without it. The tool itself is for getting access into the smoke box door. And the reason for this very quickly becomes clear. Now this plastic is molded to avoid any damage occurring to the paint finish. It's quite a soft plastic. So we're just trying to get in underneath the dish of the smoke box door. It's just a little bit tight in places. Not too difficult, just persevere with it. It just leave us out like that. I'm just being quite careful because the smoke box dart is separately fitted, very, very slender, and I don't want to risk damaging it. As you can see, just make a note that the hinges go to, as you look at the front of the locomotive, to the right. Just, um, I know that there's also the lamp bracket on there, but uh, just to make sure you don't refit it upside down. And you can see then inside the front of the locomotive, we've got again another one of the party tricks of the Daypol locomotives. And this is the daughter board, which makes DCC fitting so, so easy. And I did get into trouble last time we reviewed one of these Daypol models. I used needle nose pliers to pull this out. But of course the tool on the other end, it is a multi-tool and it does have a little nub in just to hook into and pull out this daughter board. So for the DCC fit, you're going to need a Next18 decoder. And that's where we've got the Trainomatic Next18 decoder. And we do have a link down below to take you to Tramfabrik to find the appropriate one. On this board, you can see the blanking plug, which just lifts out, no tools required. And then we're going to just take the decoder and orientate this the same way that the blanking plug was. And you can see there, it's really quite simple. Mate up the male and the female. Doesn't need a lot of pressure at all. Really, if you're having to force it, then it's not in the right place. And you can see there, it self fits into place. And they're really nice and small. And that's it, the decoder is in place. If you do fit the model with a speaker, we've got solder-free connectors underneath. You can just see them there and there. And the correctly designed speaker to fit into this just has two tabs sprung-loaded that rest onto there. And that's all you need to get this locomotive DCC sound fitted. And the speaker enclosure just clips into place giving you that resonance chamber around the appropriate speaker. And actually for safekeeping, I'm just gonna leave the speaker enclosure in uh, because, well, it's not really gonna be hurting anybody in there. And at least then I know exactly where it needs to be. There's a set of runners down either side and this just slips into those and you can feel it almost like a groove either side. Just drop it in and just gently with a finger, push it home. Don't force it, make sure you've got it that way up. And once that's in, we take the smoke box door, line it back up the way it was. And again, very carefully, just push it home. Use the tool if you need to. It is quite a tight fit, uh, a little bit tighter than I found on the Mogul that was released from Daypole previously, but certainly no big deal, and that's all in place. There's no risk of that just falling out on the track. And the locomotive is now DCC fitted, and we can take this now to the programming track and then to the layout. When it came to performing on the track, the model really did perform well. 
I managed to get it to haul nine of the quite heavy Hornby Gresley coaches with just a little bit of slipping starting to creep in where it was going up one of the gradients on Weir Yard. But overall that was actually pretty good and it puts into touch the performance from the 260 Mogul that was released previously from Daypole which did seem to struggle a little bit for grip. It's nice to see that Daypole have addressed that with this model and we really do have a top-notch performer. I started running this with zero running in and actually it performed really well. The slow speed control was still really really good and even as I ran it on the layout you can see in the video footage that the performance just got smoother and better and better and I really had no great issue at all with the running of this model. When it came to the firebox flicker, I have to say I was pleasantly surprised. I'd been resigned to probably having to program CVs just to make sure that we got the flickering effect, but actually there was no problem with the Trainomatic decoder. It just natively worked on either F0 or F1, although I couldn't discern what the difference was between the two. It appeared to be using the two different functions but there was no difference to me, to my eyes, when I switched one or the other off. It was a really effective flicker, and for me, it did exactly what it said it should on the tin. So we turn now to the scores. First up is build quality, and by and large, I was really, really pleased with the model. It came with an awful lot of what you would normally expect to have to fit yourself, factory fitted. The only potential issue I had was that these rails just at the back of the cab weren't attached with a huge amount of glue just at the top of the cab sides and that did mean that with handling they did have a tendency to pop free but they were still contained top and bottom so it wasn't really a big deal but I just thought that it was as well to point this out so I'm going to give this a 9.9 .9. On running quality, it really was a great improvement over the 260 Mogul, handling that nine coach train really well, although it was apparent on the gradients that it was pushing up to the limit. But on the flat track, this could certainly handle more than that, and that's more than enough for the average modeler. So I'm going to give it a 9.8. .8. On DCC fitting and innovation, again, the model scores really highly. I like the way that they've sorted out that DCC firebox flicker so it just works natively regardless of what brand of decoder you fit the model with. The slide out daughter board with the tool that just comes with the model really makes DCC fitting this even with sound an absolute doddle. I also really like that innovative tender drawbar mechanism whereby they just slide together or decouple depending on whether you want to separate or attach the tender. It really couldn't be simpler. So really, there's nothing else other than the full 10 marks to award this model. On accuracy and quality of finish, there really wasn't anything to report to count against it. It really is a great model with plenty of weight and also the decoration just sharp and crisp where it needs to be. All in all, there wasn't a huge amount to note. The only area where I really could fault a little bit was inside the cab and the back of the locomotive just looked a little bit bare and seemed to lack something. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But overall, it really is a great model and you're not going to notice that when you've got it connected up and running. So I'm going to give it a 9.7. On value for money, the model is available DCC ready for £160. You can also get it DCC fitted with a standard decoder and this will be a Daypol Imperium. With the full sound fitting which includes that bass speaker in the tender it's £260 and in this day and age I thought that that was a great price compared to some of the competition models that are coming through which have already reached and beached that £200 mark just for a standard non-DCC fitted model. So I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. And that gives an overall score of 49.4. That's a great score for a great model. And it gets the Jenny Kirk thumbs up of approval. We've got some affiliate links down below to help you find your own version of this model, either in the Great Western Railway Green or indeed any of the other versions that are available right through to British Rail and Preserved. 
it certainly is a worthwhile model to buy and you won't be disappointed. Well, I hope you really enjoyed today's video and found it informative. And of course, as always, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section down below. What are your thoughts on this model? Leave a comment and I do read them all. Don't forget as well that you can like, share and subscribe and also head on over to Patreon and help support the channel to keep making those videos that you want to see. And we've also got an affiliate link to uh, help you find your own version of the Daypole Manor featured in today's video. And a big, big thank you to Daypole for sending it over so we could do this review. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirkson. You take great care of yourself. Until next time, take care, happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video comes in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCT decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support for today's video comes from All Mouse Media, publisher of books and graphics novels, which can be found at the link down below. Check them out today, including the amazing Stars books. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon, and an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshaw Allen, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYM Arish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 class, Ian Coulson, Alan Dickerson, Eddie Papair, Karen Nicholl, Medwin Williams, Crossways Point Junction, 3B Rail, and Jennifer Garrett. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.